Good morning, First Baptist Church. Welcome to our online worship experience. I'm recording this worship service or this worship meditation on Friday at about 12 o'clock. As of right now, the weather forecast is saying that on Sunday, when you're likely watching this video, uh, we're supposed to have rain and snow and ice in Gainesville. And the meteorologists seem pretty certain that we're going to have at least some of that. So I don't know how bad it is right now as you're watching this, but at the very least, we determined that it would probably be a good idea to go ahead and suspend our in-person activities to keep you safe, but also to include more people in our worship experience and in our Sunday school and small groups. So I hope that today, not only will you experience this online worship service, but that you'll be able to touch base with your Sunday school classes or small groups uh, and to be able to study God's Word there. So once again, we're glad you've joined us for this online worship experience. Uh, today we're going to continue to talk about what it means to be in a transformed community, which we believe is one of the essential aspects of spiritual health and spiritual growth through the life of the church. So today I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles or devices to the book of James chapter 5. We're going to focus on verses 13 through 20, if you'd like to follow along. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. If any of you are sick, they should call for the elders of the church, and the elders should pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. For this reason, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. Elijah was a person just like us. When he earnestly prayed that it wouldn't rain, no rain fell for three and a half years. He prayed again. God sent rain and the earth produced its fruit. My brothers and sisters, if any one of you wander from the truth and someone turns back the wanderer, recognize that whoever brings a sinner back from the wrong path will save them from death and will bring about the forgiveness of many sins. The book of James is a small but challenging epistle in the New Testament. It talks about perseverance in the midst of trials, and, and more to the point, it talks about the importance of, Christian, of the Christian life uh, flowing out of our belief in Christ and our faith in Christ. And in fact, the, the whole point of the book of James uh, is summed up in that most quotable scripture that faith without works is dead. Now, it might disappoint you to know that Martin Luther, the author of the Protestant Reformation, was not a terribly huge fan of the book of James. In fact, in some of his early writings and commentary, he said, to state my own opinion about it, it is flatly against St. Paul and all the rest of Scripture. He would go on to say, James does nothing more than drive to the law and its works, and he mixes up the two in such disorderly fashion. So Martin Luther is being pretty harsh here on the book of James. And in fact, this is the real kicker. He says that John's gospel and his first letter, uh, Paul's epistles, especially Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and Peter's first epistle, are the books that show you Christ and teach you all that is necessary. And he goes on to say, St. James' epistle is really an epistle of straw compared to the others, for it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it. Now, Am I allowed to disagree with Martin Luther? I don't usually like to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that kind of clout. It's not something you're going to hear me do very often. But I do disagree with Martin Luther to say that this book doesn't present the nature of the gospel. I don't think he could be more wrong in that statement. No, it doesn't flesh out the, the ins and outs of, of Christian theology like Paul does throughout several of his letters. And there's not as much talk about uh, specific theological implications like salvation, sanctification, justification, heaven, hell, predestination, free will. I realize those are some really big ideas that aren't necessarily fleshed out in the same way that the Apostle Paul might have done. 
but it does give us a clear picture of the gospel lived out in community. And that is just as important a part of the conversation for what it means to truly understand and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with each other. With, with each other. And so where I think Martin Luther missed the point, and yes, where I think we miss the point at times as well, is that this Christian life and the gospel is something that happens in, in, in some ethereal plane of existence, but not among us in our community or in our sufferings, or in our ills, as we experience forgiveness and acceptance in Jesus' name together. So today we'll be talking about this passage in the book of James relatively briefly, uh, but we'll be reminded that gathering and praying for each other and living together in community is part of the healing power of the gospel, because we do so in Jesus' name. As our passage today opens up, we, we read of James' word about praying for each other and, and asking for others to pray for us and really to seek out healing. It's important to seek out others to heal, but also to be healed in Jesus' name. And as with the theme and the nature of Scripture, uh, our faith is lived out and it is felt with other people. It's part of expressing the joy of Christ and walking with each other in our suffering. So uh, the author of James, or James, talks about how it's real, It's both and. We pray in the times of suffering and trial, but we also pray in those times when we're experiencing great joy in Jesus' name. And together, those can be a great healing act for us. He goes on to talk about how we do all of this under the posture of prayer. And James reminds us that that prayer and healing can't be separated. They're they're not mutually exclusive. And so in our joys and in our weaknesses and, and in our grief and even in our times of praise, we experience God's healing with each other. And that is why it is so critical that we gather and meet together in the presence of community. Yes, ideally in person, but on days like today or other days where we can't gather, uh, to gather by way of Zoom or FaceTime or outside, the important thing is that we are just, we are together and we are not living the Christian life in isolation. James also talks about the importance of confession, confessing our sins to each other, uh, which is not something that we often do. Confession means being vulnerable and swallowing our pride and, and exposing ourselves to, to attack and criticism and, and judgment. Kay Ann Smith, our, our uh, music assistant, does an awesome job with the prayer list. And, and you receive that prayer list multiple times a week so that you can learn how to pray for those in our church community and beyond who are experiencing uh, real physical ills or suffering. And that's tremendously helpful as we pray together. But one thing we don't often call into the prayer list are other ways that we suffer or other ways that we need healing. We especially don't call Kay Ann and say, hey, Kay Ann, uh, I'm struggling with greed. Would you mind putting that on the prayer list? Or, hey, Kay Ann, I'm struggling with treating others with love and compassion and grace. Could you please put me on the prayer list for that? I mean, think about that. What if we confessed to each other and prayed for each other in those ways as well, and in those ways expected to find healing for that? James tells us that it is in such time when we pray and confess and ask for support within the community, we achieve much. Now, let me back up and say there are certain things that we shouldn't call into the prayer list. Of course, there is a place for for privacy, but that's also why it's important that we gather with our small groups. Yes, there are things that I struggle with that I don't necessarily want to broadcast to the entire community, But if I had a small group of individuals who I was doing the Christian life with and we were studying scripture together and supporting each other, I might want to share with them my struggles on a more intimate level with the anticipation that because they will pray for me and pray with me in Jesus' name, that I would experience healing. And in the same way, they would experience healing because I have made it an active part of my life to pray and to pray in Jesus' name so that they would be healed, not just of their physical suffering, but also of their spiritual suffering, 
of their mental suffering, of their emotional suffering and relational or financial suffering, all the kinds of ways that we face challenges in this life. We should pray for each other in the context of a transformative community. James also mentions in the scripture that it really is all about prayer and seeking that healing and through the power of prayer. He mentions Elijah, and in many ways, James is saying, look, Elijah wasn't Superman. Praying was the key. We too can pray and expect our world to change dramatically. Now, being together in Christian community and seeking healing is in many ways, and it shouldn't be, but it is, it's a radical countercultural te- uh, teaching to be together in a community of healing and valuing each other and seeking unity. It, it does appear and seem that the trend is merely to offer poisonous words or venomous words or critical words about each other. And no, Christians aren't immune from this challenge. It's not unusual for us to gather in our echo chambers and spend all of our time offering critical words about other uh, other people or other families or communities or or other churches or other faiths, and we, we just like to, to do that together. I, I guess it makes us feel good about ourselves. We can't spend all our time together talking about what, what's wrong in the world around us. That, that can't be the only subject of our discussion. We, at times, need to hold up our own mirrors tend to the planks in our own eyes. What if we made sure our gatherings had edifying times as mentioned in the book of James? Times to to offer healing words to each other, uh, times to teach each other, times to clarify God's word and to offer forgiveness, times where we could confess our sins without fear or judgment. I think that's what today's scripture truly challenges us to do. It's a reminder that faith practice is active, and in that faith practice, we must also practice healing with God and with each other in community in Jesus' name. I want to share a brief video with you. We showed this video in our banquet service uh, back in the fall, uh, but I want all of you to see it. It goes so well with our scripture today. It's a word from Sarah Miles, who is an author and a pastoral caregiver and director of an organization called The Food Pantry. I want you to listen to her words about the difference between curing and healing and what it means to be healed into community. So... You know, I work a lot uh, doing pastoral care, so I work with a lot of people who are sick or dying or um, crazy or going through a horrible divorce or, you know, any of the million ways that we know how to suffer and make each other suffer. Um, And one of the things that I've come to understand through doing this with other people, through praying with other people, through doing healing prayer with other people, is that healing is not the same thing as curing. Curing is about fixing or managing or solving a problem. Healing doesn't necessarily look like what we want it to look like. Healing happens on God's time and it's possible to not be cured but to be healed. You know, I think of people who've died in great pain and really great sickness and yet have found a way to be restored um, to some kind of reconciled life with their family in the middle of that. More importantly, I think when somebody is healed, they're never healed by themselves. They're healed into community because the real healing that God's always doing is restoring creation to order, right? And that's the work we participate in when we're doing healing prayer. So the people that we cast out because they're blind or they're crippled or they're crazy, God is yearning to pull them back into the whole so that the whole can be healed. Not just so that the blind person can see, but so that the sighted ones can have the experience of being an undivided community. Uh, And healing prayer, because it happens with the whole community, 
is always about participating in that work of restoration that God is about. Um, and it doesn't always fix problems, right? It doesn't always make everybody happy. It doesn't always cure somebody's cold, you know? It doesn't cure anything. Prayer doesn't cure anything, but prayer heals. Because as I said, it's like prayer is about relationship. And as we get pulled more deeply into relationship with God and into relationship with God's people, um, we become wholer as the whole becomes wholer, um, even when we're sick as dogs. I pray that today you are challenged to live out the gospel in community and to offer words of healing to fellow Christians and also those who, who have not yet heard or experienced the healing power of Jesus. That's the challenging word for us from James today. And in the word of James, let's be reminded as we offer healing words to each other that faith without works is truly dead. No, we are called to live out the gospel with our words and with our actions, with our hands and feet as we seek to be the presence of Jesus to one another. May it be so for us as we go about our lives today. Thank you, God, for inspiring us every day to use our voices to speak out against injustice, our hands to help those who are vulnerable, our feet to learn to walk in the other person's shoes, our hearts to pour out compassion and empathy, our minds to apply solutions in ways that make a difference. Thank you, God, for reminding us one person can change the world that all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed and courage the height of a shepherd boy and wisdom that's given to anyone who asks. Entire generations have marched towards a hope they thought they'd never have. Mindsets have changed when there seemed only a dim chance. You, Lord, walk the streets of every community, watching, listening for those who are willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me. History has shown us what you can do when one single soul becomes willing to do your work. May we be willing today, Lord, to make a difference.